years ago, I joined an expedition to explore the deep sea off the coast of Southern California. Our ship was a floating laboratory. We had all of the best equipment, including a submersible that would go down to the bottom of the ocean to collect samples and record data. We were there to figure out what the microbes were doing, what kind of ecosystems they were forming on the seafloor, and what that might mean in terms of ecosystem change and global warming. And we were positioned about eight miles off the coast of Los Angeles, the second biggest city in the country, home to more than 15 million people. At night, you could see the city lights illuminate the sky. And yet, when we put the robot down, just underneath the surface, about a few hundred meters down, we saw this. We saw a whole new world that no one had ever seen before. There are these thick carpets of white and orange microbial mats that are eating sulfur. There are these gnarled chimneys of carbonate rocks and shells of clams all over the place, slow-moving fish and crabs. This was a place no one had ever seen before, and it was just off the coast of Los Angeles. We've since learned that the microbes inside these rocks are consuming methane at rates that are among the highest ever measured. Methane is obviously a very strong greenhouse gas, so the microbes that keep, them, keep that methane from getting up into the water, into the atmosphere, are doing us a pretty important service. As a deep-sea biologist, I am enormously privileged to see some of the hidden corners of our world. Off the coast of New England, we saw this deep-sea canyon where the wall is just covered with deep-water corals. These can live up to 4,000 years and are the longest-lived organisms in the oceans. Hydrothermal vents. Here, there's enormous amounts of energy coming out of the seafloor. Superheated water is being used and metabolized by the microbes that form the basis of ecosystems that are as thick and as biodiverse as the Amazon rainforest. There is so much crazy stuff in the ocean. Um, those are just the microbes, but we also see these weird gelatinous goo forms called siphonophores. They can be 40 meters long, and they're clonal organisms. Each bit is doing a slightly different type of physiology. There are Ocidex worms, so these may look fluffy and cuddly, but these are boring into bones and consuming the nutrients inside bones. They can find whale carcasses that fall to the bottom of the ocean, separated by hundreds of kilometers. We're still even seeing really fundamental things about larger systems, beaked whales have recently been found to dive about 3,000 meters to the bottom of the ocean. They could hold their breath for more than two hours. And sea mounts, underwater mountains, there could be tens of thousands of these dotting the seafloor all over the world. Ecosystems could differ depending on where on that mountain you are, just like we see mountains here on land. What's crazy, though, is that everything I've just showed you comes from the 0.01% of the seafloor that we've seen in any detail. That means that the vast, vast majority of the seafloor, the 99.99%, looks kind of like this. We're completely in the dark. We have no idea what's happening. This is the equivalent of if Lewis and Clark had, in, before setting out on their journey across the American West, left their home base of St. Louis, and instead of going thousands of kilometers to the Pacific Ocean, instead of finding the Rocky Mountains and Buffalo and a whole new ocean, if instead of that, they just spent their entire time on the half mile of the Missouri River outside of St. Louis. That's the same proportion of the seafloor that we've only scratched the surface of. And you might think that because there's so much that's been unseen, that it is being unaffected by some of the anthropogenic changes we see here on land. Climate change, maybe not an issue, but unfortunately that's not the case. The oceans are a massive conveyor belt. They can carry pollutants, they can carry trash from times past, times present, halfway around the world, to some of the most remote places on Earth. So these methane seeps, the areas I study most, a lot of these microbes are living inside rocks, inside limestone. And we don't really know what's going to happen when some of the tendrils of global warming or ocean acidification start to reach the seafloor. If they dissolve these rocks, what could that do to the methane cycle? Could a lot of that methane end up in the atmosphere? In the Mariana Trench, the deepest part of our ocean, deeper than Mount Everest is tall, even down there, plastic bags are found. And within the shells of these crustaceans, scientists recently found PCBs, pollutants that are made from industrial processes, again, halfway across the world. There are also more acute threats to the global ocean. 
like deep sea mining. This is set to begin in a couple of years. Mining companies are particularly interested in these manganese nodules, these potato-sized clumps of rocks that can be tens of millions of years old, cobalt crusts that coat the outside of these seamounts, these underwater mountains, and metal-rich sulfides at hydrothermal vents. These are among the most unique ecosystems we know about. And a lot of what makes that exploitation possible is the lack of a unifying set of laws based around the high seas. The high seas are the bits of the ocean that are beyond the 230-mile limit of national jurisdiction. So that's 45% of the planet. That is essentially the Wild West. This means that we don't really know what's going to happen in this area of the seafloor when deep sea mining begins. It's possible that that is actually going to be the most environmentally friendly way to get our metals. We don't know. The issue, though, is that we don't even know what it's like to begin with. We're already starting to affect these areas before we even understand them. For example, by destroying a place like this and extracting the min minerals out of it, we could be disrupting elemental cycles we know nothing about, as carbon or nitrogen or sulfur or oxygen are thrown out of whack. We could be eliminating microbes whose antibiotics could cure diseases. We could be destroying the geological context that could point us toward the origin of life or form an essential analog environment as we look for life beyond Earth. There's such a huge opportunity cost to not understanding these systems before we go in and start to affect them. This is like digging in your backyard before checking for any natural gas pipes or electrical lines. What we need is a comprehensive set of laws that cover the high seas so that we're all playing with the, by the same rules and we know where to begin. Fortunately, that might actually be happening. So the UN is set over the next couple of years to bring up this question and to think about how to govern biodiversity on the high seas. And this is a big deal. It's taken decades to get to this stage. And it's going to take decades more to see it put into place, enforced in the right way, and made to work for everyone. This is, again, a very long process with a lot of technical hurdles. It's going to fade from the headlines. It's going to be pretty intense. We're going to get into the weeds on some of these issues around marine genetic resources, what to do with biodiversity, how to make sure that these benefits are indeed shared by all of humankind. But the important thing is that we're at a really important inflection point. This is maybe the best chance we've ever had to conserve what's out there in the high seas and make sure that we establish rules to govern our global oceans in a way that works for everyone, not just the scientists, who have a lot of important discoveries to make, but also the people whose livelihoods depend on the ocean, who get their calories from the ocean, and who depend on shipping containers going across the oceans. But to me, the most important thing is to conserve the opportunity to make these fundamental discoveries before it's too late. Thank you. <laughs>